novel, God Bless Cam Cambodia, was published in 2017 by the Permanent Press, a publisher of literary fiction. His one-man show, The Chronic Singles Handbook, has been featured at indie theater festivals in the United States, Canada, and in Edinburgh, Scotland. In 2007, Ross took a trip around the world and learned to say in three languages, speak English, got Pepto-Bismol, and where's the evacuation helicopter? His novel and one-man show were inspired by the trip. Previously, Ross was executive editor for PC World Magazine. He holds a master's in journalism from Northwestern University and is currently writing a second novel. So please join me in welcoming Randy Ross. Great. Thanks, Paul. I uh, also want to thank the Thomas Crane Library for hosting me tonight. I got two requests, and that's one of them. So if people could please silence their uh, cell phones. Uh, the second request is, uh, if you have any questions, if you can save them to the end. Uh, the show is only an hour, and we've got plenty of time for Q&A, so if you can save it. <laughs> so if you save any questions for the end, uh, that'll be great. How are we doing with those phones? Everybody good? Okay. And now, welcome to Tales of a Reluctant World Traveler. Cholera, plague, Japanese encephalitis, typhoid, typhus, trench fever, yellow fever, dengue fever, diphtheria, dysentery. That's just a sampling of what I could face on an upcoming four-month solo trip around the world. According to the experts, I wasn't supposed to drink the water, eat the food, or kiss the women. Walking barefoot and swimming in fresh water? No way. But there was one thing I feared more than any ghastly third world disease, and I'm going to get to that a little later. So this trip took place in 2007. I'd been working as an editor for PC World Magazine. One day, laid off. A couple months later, my girlfriend gave me the heave ho. So I spent a couple days moping around my apartment, and I spent a couple of days moping around the gym, and then I started moping around the local bookstore. And I found myself in the travel section. I started looking through all the, uh, all the travel guidebooks. You guys are familiar with Lonely Planet and Rough Guide. And you know, they've all got these beautiful pictures and the assumptions, descriptions, and the places you'll go, and the people you'll meet, and the things you'll do. And pretty soon, I could almost smell the coconut suntan lotion. <laughs> I could almost hear the bellowing of howler monkeys and the screeching of macaws. But there was one thing that concerned me. Every one of these books had a graphic, detailed passage on sexually transmitted diseases. So my first reaction was, whoa. But then I thought, wait a minute. Sounds like these world travelers are a friendly bunch. <laughs> <laughs> so using the books, I booked a four-month solo trip around the world. Do it yourself. Started in Boston, went to Venezuela, Greece, South Africa, Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia, Australia, New Zealand, and back to Boston. Now most people, they go on an exotic trip, they come back and they rave about what a great time they had and the wonderful food and the sights and the, the, the friendly local people. I'm not going to say that they're lying. I'm just going to say my experience was a little different. You might say there were some teachable moments. You might say it was an experience more than a vacation. Actually, I'm not going to lie, I had a rotten, miserable time for large portions of the trip. And I take some responsibility for that. Before this trip, I was not an experienced traveler. I'd been on two week vacations to Canada, two weeks in Mexico, two weeks in Europe. But you know, that's a vacation. Two weeks, if you're having a rotten time, you know you're coming home. This is four months of solo travel. And you don't know if you're configured to take a trip like this. 
until you actually do it. Another issue, I'm not the hardiest person in the world. I don't like weird noises, weird smells, being crammed together with people who sweat. Public toilet seats, some people put down one layer of toilet paper, I put down three. Another issue, I spent a lot of time, too much time on the internet. So after I'd already bought the tickets, I couldn't stay off the internet. And guess what I found? <laughs> so this is a slide of, from the Center for Disease Control website. And these are all the diarrhea hotspots around the world, the, the ones in red. And you notice the arrows in black, that's where I was going to be traveling. So I was going to be hitting all the diarrhea hotspots. But there was one thing that concerned me even more. Has anybody heard of something called guinea worm disease? I'm sure you have. Okay, so guinea worm disease, I mentioned earlier um, that a lot of places you're not supposed to drink the water or even swim in fresh water because what they're concerned about are parasites and guinea worm is a parasite. And apparently the way this works is you ingest the water and over a course of time, the parasite grows into a three foot worm and you can feel it crawling around under your skin. And then when it's ready to reproduce, it pops its head out of a blister in your foot. I, actually, you guys want me to uh, change this slide? A lot of people get kind of, you look kind of freaked out. Um, I, I, I don't want to upset anybody. I don't want to trigger anyone. Actually, I, I mean, I really, I really need this gig. And oh, What the hell? Yeah. So that's when I decided to consult an expert. Six weeks before my departure, I found myself in the waiting room of a Boston travel vaccine clinic. A nurse wearing a black hoodie under a lab coat hustles me into her office. Her computer has a bumper sticker, I stop for entrails. So, she asks, where are we heading? Uh, let's see, I'm going to Greece and South Africa and Venezuela and Thailand and Cambodia and Australia and some other places. Wow, wish I got that much vacation. Actually, I just lost my job. Aw, bummer. <laughs> she taps her keyboard and then looks directly at me. You're gonna need seven shots, three more visits, and we'll need some blood. <gasps> A new BA, you'll be fine. She hands me pamphlets on malaria and something called chicken gunja fever. Then, she starts doling out the prescriptions. If you get the runs, in Vietnam, take ciprofloxacin. In Thailand, take azithromycin. In Cambodia, I want you to take Pepto-Bismol daily. It can turn your tongue black, but some women might like that look. <laughs> By the time she finishes with me, I'm afraid to leave my apartment, never mind the country. But there's no turning back. I've already spent $6,000 on plane tickets. I better pack, come back with something that doesn't require antibiotics. A job, a woman, or at least some material for my Match.com profile. But the best part of my visit to the vaccine nurse, the places I was going, no guinea worms. <coughs> so off I went. No guinea worms. On August 28, 2007, I depart for Venezuela with one piece of luggage, my new $200 backpack crammed with overpriced travel clothes, medications, water purifying tablets, earplugs, nose plugs, dust masks, safety pins, bobby pins, duct tape, scotch tape, surgical tape, Allen wrenches, and other gear recommended by the guidebooks. As the flight attendant discusses water landings, sweat collects beneath the money belt strapped under my pants. I glance at my seatmates. Two elderly women sucking on hard candies. They don't seem worried. Last year, I went to France and came back in one piece. But Venezuela's a little more dangerous than France. Okay, it's a lot more dangerous than France. Okay, it has one of the highest murder rates in the world. And at the Caracas airport, a driver is picking me up at the international terminal just to take me 100 yards to the domestic terminal because it's not safe to walk around outside unescorted. 
But if some hoodlum draws a weapon, I'll just fork over the decoy travel wallet around my neck. Containing $20 and an expired Macy's charge card. These guidebooks know all the tricks. As I'm adjusting the decoy wallet, I hear a loud crack and clutch my seat cushion, which I've heard can double as a flotation device. A cloud of cinnamon stings inside my nostrils. The lady next to me is chomping on a fireball. I sneeze into the sleeve of my moisture-wicking Oxford and resume my personal inventory. A hidden security pocket in my shirt contains photocopies of my passport and credit cards, plus US consulate phone numbers for the seven countries I'm visiting. My money belt holds my water plane tickets, $500 in cash, and a list of Western trained doctors on each continent. I've emailed myself scanned images of my tickets, passport, and immunization <coughs> card. I've taken every precaution recommended by the guidebook and the State Department. The rest is up to fate. There's a tap on my arm. I instinctively cover the money belt with my hand. The woman next to me smiles and hands me a jawbreaker. Her elbow brushes mine. I relinquish the armrest and stare at the ceiling. The seatbelt sign goes off. The drink cart is free to move about the cabin. So this is Venezuela. It's at the base of the Caribbean. And what I was doing is I was flying into Caracas International Airport. And then I was, what, my final destination was uh, Margarita Island. So that's like the Martha's Vineyard, or it used to be the Martha's Vineyard of Venezuela. And I was going to be going windsurfing. So I booked this whole trip to Venezuela with a windsurfing company on Margarita Island. And they gave me very specific instructions. Uh, when, I get to the, when I get into the international terminal, I'm to look for a guy with a card with my name on it. I find the guy, he grabs my hand, he takes me out to the curb, we get into this huge black SUV, we drive 100 yards to the domestic terminal. He grabs my hand, we get out of the car, he takes me to the, the uh, ticket counter, he buys my ticket and he points to a chair and says, you sit there and you stay there until they call your flight. I get it. Caracas is a dangerous place. Another issue with the trip was this whole concept of budget travel. You know, reading the guidebooks, I kind of didn't really get it. So one of the issues, uh, budget travel, they also call it backpacking. So if you're backpacking, you're basically living out of a backpack. So uh, the clothes I took me, I was traveling for four months. That's six, actually it was like 17 weeks. If it didn't fit in the backpack, it didn't come on the trip. So I was basically wearing the same clothes for 17 weeks. I did wash them. Um, when I got home, some of them I had to burn, but some of them were fine. Uh, actually, I wore these pants and this shirt. This is the actual backpack I took with me. And w what you actually do, you actually carry around two backpacks. So on the front, you have a small one. And this has your tickets, your water, your passport, anything you're going to need right away. And on your back goes the big one. So if you see people walking around town and they got two backpacks, they're not just going camping, they're, they're traveling for probably a long period of time. Another issue was, uh, so I was gone for 16, 17 weeks, I couldn't afford to stay at Hyatt Regencies every night. So the one thing the guidebooks recommend is you stay at youth hostels. And who stays at youth hostels? Youth. Youths. <laughs> most, people, most people that take a trip like this are in their 20s. I was 48, so this is, this is in New Zealand. And I'm out with all my hostel pals, and they're all having a great, ah, oh, this is great, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm over here, just get me out of here, please. <laughs> Another issue with budget travel, the flights. I wasn't going first class. I wasn't going business class. I was barely going coach. So a lot of these flights were red eyes. They had multiple stops. Uh, in one month, I took three red eyes. I mean, here's a sample of some of them. Gave Venezuela to uh, Greece, 
That's kind of a standard, standard flight, not too bad. Greece to South Africa, that was 10 hours. Uh, the good thing is it's uh, the time, same time zone. But the worst, the absolute worst flight was from South Africa to Bangkok. So that was, uh, so w one thing I did was whenever I, had a, whenever I had a stopover, I made sure it was four to five hours, because that way if the flight coming in was late, I would have plenty of time to, to make it up, because if you miss one of these flights, it's kind of a cascading effect and you could end up getting stuck somewhere. So my flight from South Africa to Bangkok was about 28 hours, including the uh, stopovers. That, that's the selfie I took getting off the plane. <laughs> so I left Cape Town at 7 a.m., I flew to Johannesburg, four hour stopover. I flew from Johannesburg to Hong Kong, five hour stopover, and then Hong Kong to Bangkok. So I left at 7 a.m., I arrived at 4 p.m. the next day. It was rotten and miserable, and I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, and I mentioned the youth hostels filled with youths. Still, there was one thing I feared more than a youth hostel filled with youths, and I'm going to get to that in a little later. Another issue was somehow my expectations were a little out of line. So I was going windsurfing in a bunch of these countries. So this is windsurfing in Venezuela. It was fabulous. The wind was great. Um, I didn't get murdered even once. So. Um, I, as far as windsurfing, I'm like a beginner, intermediate windsurfer, so if it winds 15 to 20 miles an hour, I'm fine. So Venezuela, great. Next stop, oops. <laughs> Next stop was Greece, an island called Karpathos. Correct pronunciation? Karpathos. So it's uh, southern Dodecanese, it's deep in the Mediterranean. And again, I was expecting, you know, 15, 20 mile an hour winds, and I get there and Yes, it's 40 mile an hour winds. Uh, I started off at the adult windsurfing beach and they took me by the ear and moved me down to the kiddie beach and I still couldn't stay on the windsurfer. So I caught a cold, not a good experience. So the next place I was gonna go windsurfing was South Africa. So I was expecting something like this. And I'm in, I'm in Cape Town and I'm flipping through the, some of the travel literature I notice they've got windsurfing, but there's, a, there's another very popular activity in Cape Town, and it's um, shark cage diving. <laughs> so the way this works is you pay an outfitter a lot of money, they, drive, they take you out in a boat, they put you in this metal cage, they toss you over the side, and then you can pet the great white sharks. So I was thinking to myself, hmm, okay, let's see, windsurfing, great white sharks, windsurfing, Great white sharks. <laughs> windsurfing, great white sharks. Windsurfing, great white sharks. No thank you. Still, there was one thing I feared more than being eaten alive by a great white shark, and I'm gonna get to that a little later. Another issue was, you know, all these guidebooks, they recommend things to do when you're in whatever the place is. So uh, I was in Cambodia. I went to Angkor Wat. It was fine. Angkor Wat, uh, people familiar with that? It's, it's the largest religious structure in the world. Um, it's, if you're going to go to Angkor Wat, you go to a town called Siem Reap. And I went to Angkor Wat. I was like, yeah, okay, I've seen some temples. Enough, enough with this. Uh, another activity that they had in town was something called the crocodile farm. So there's, you know, there's 16, 18 foot reptiles. Um, here's an aerial view and you know, they're down there sunning and there's walls all around it. And on, this, on the other side of this particular wall, there was a swimming hole filled with children. I was like, eh, no thank you. <laughs> Another activity in Cambodia is called Thunder Ranch. So uh, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the uh, pretty harsh history of Cambodia, especially 70s, 80s, and 90s. So it was, uh, Civil War, genocide, invasion by the Vietnamese, uh, more civil war. Uh, the country didn't really have a stable government until like 1998, 1999. I was there in 2007. So but what you had was a lar large portions of the population running around with military grade weapons. 
So some entrepreneurial types, entrepreneurial types got together and was like, why don't we start a shooting range for tourists? So my understanding of how this worked, you go to Thunder Ranch and you get a menu. First column, drinks. Middle column, military grade weapons. And the third column is livestock. So you could get a martini, rocket launcher, and then blow a hole in a cow. Or if maybe you're more of a wine drinker, you get like a little sauterne and a machine gun and then a bunch of chickens. No, thank you. And then there were some just outright lies in these books. Stuff that was just either they, stuff they forgot to mention or didn't want to mention or that was just plain wrong. Uh, the first one, so this is uh, in Melbourne. Uh, this is a place called the Flinders Street train station. And let me just describe my experience in Melbourne. Melbourne, Australia. And I changed, I changed the name of the uh, hotel to protect the not so innocent. After dumping my bags at Melbourne's Wooloroo Inn, a Best Western knockoff near the center of town, I amble down Swanston Street to the waterfront, the Yarrow River, taking in the Aussie scene. A fly lands on my lip. I swat it away. Crossing Bourke Street, I spot the stone facade and copper dome of Hel Melbourne's historic Flinders Street train station. Skyscrapers hover in the distance. Skyscrapers, copper dome, stone facade, another fly, another swat. A woman in a suit exits the train station and waves. Do I know her? A tattooed girl on a cell phone waves too. Then a guy on a skateboard. Something tunnels in my nose. Something skitters in my underwear. Flies are collecting on me as if I were a rotting carcass. I join everyone around me, cursing, waving, and squatting. I flee down Flinders Street and duck into the Melbourne Aquarium. Animal feeding time begins in five minutes. Then I notice the admission price, $25. Mm -mm. Outside again, the flies are feeding. I've just traveled through Southeast Asia, a land of deadly mosquitoes and terrifying diseases. A few Western bugs shouldn't faze me, but my t-shirt is now a vibrating vest of flies. I run bobbing and weaving by a movie theater, $12 for a Mel Gibson flick. I'm Jewish. We don't pay retail for Mel Gibson movies. <laughs> Back at the Wooloroo Inn, I confront the desk clerk as if, it were somehow, if she were somehow to blame. What's with the flies? I thought Australia was a civilized, developed country. She says nothing and hands me a tourist card entitled The Australian Bushfly. From October through January, bushflies are common in Melbourne. The insects feed on bodily fluids, tears, sweat, saliva, and mucus. Bushflies do not bite or sting. They lay their eggs in animal dung, not on humans. What a relief. The Aussie salute, a waving motion used by locals to repel the flies. Suggestion, wear a hat with a mesh net, cover that co with a mesh net that covers the face. Hmm. By coincidence, a sign behind the desk clerk advertises mesh net hats with the Wooloo logo for $30. <laughs> I don't pay retail for hats with logos. So there was no mention of bush flies in any of the literature or any of the guidebooks I read. But this is like a big problem. But actually, you don't have to take my word, word for it. Can I change the slide now? Yes. No, they don't bite. We can discuss afterwards. <laughs> Another issue, an inaccuracy. So um, there are two in types of inexpensive, inexpensive places you can stay in Southeast Asia. You can stay in a hostel, or you can stay in something called a guest house. When I hear the word guest house, I'm thinking, you know, exposed beams, a six-inch pillow top mattress, 
maybe like blueberry pancakes and authentic maple syrup for breakfast the next day. But when I got to Phnom Penh, I went to a guest house called The King. And I don't see any exposed wood. But actually, let me read you the review from Lonely Planet, because they recommended this place. So remember, the name of the place is The King. Here's the review. Elvis lives on in Phnom Penh, in name at least. The range of rooms is as wide as the king's girth in the later years of his life. And there is a huge restaurant and travel center downstairs. The Lonely Planet. Can I read you my review? <laughs> it's after midnight and the king lobby is secured by a locked metal gate. I can just see a night watchman snoozing in a hammock draped with a ripped mosquito net. I tap on the gate. The man jumps up to let me in. I tip him a dollar. He gives me a little bow and climbs back into the hammock. As I start towards the darkened stairs, something lumbers around a couch, bolts past the hammock, and settles under a melamine end table. The creature is too large to be a squirrel and too small to be a Rottweiler. I crouch for a better look. It's a rat. A half-bald rat. <laughs> I follow the expert's advice for encounters with Cambodian wildlife and look for threatening gestures. Teeth gnashing, hair bristling, back arching, foot drumming, growling, ear flattening, tail between the legs, backward earth flinging with hind feet. The night watchman snores. The rat remains still, watching me. I check for foaming mouth, cowering pups nearby, teardrop tattoos around the eyes. All clear, but the bald spot kind of bothers me. I tiptoe to the staircase, giving the rat a wide berth. Sit, stay, I whisper. The night man doesn't stir. But you don't have to take my word for it. Has anyone heard of this book? It's called Do Travel Writers Go to Hell? Um, it's a true story. Nonfiction came out around the time I got back from my trip. And the book is about a Lonely Planet writer. So this young guy, the way, way it used to work with Lonely Planet is they give you some money, they send you to country, and you, you check out the hotels and the restaurants and things to do and stuff, that kind of thing, and you make recommendations. So this guy, he gets his money, he goes to Brazil, and he's supposed to cover a large portion of the country, but he, as you can see by the photo, he's having a pretty good time at the bar, and he blows all his money the first week. And he's only been to like one city. So he makes it all up. So this book, it's well written, a lot of fun, it's on the list you have there, and needless to say, Lonely Planet was not so happy when the book came out. So at this point in the trip, about three quarters of the way, I'm kind of depressed. I'm having a rotten, miserable time, and I haven't contracted a single sexually transmitted disease. <laughs> I figure I'm gonna die alone, so the sooner the better. So the first thing I start doing is eating off the street carts in Bangkok. This is one of those things they advise you not to do, but you know, a dollar for dinner, I'm in. So I started eating off the food carts in Bangkok. I ate food carts in Hanoi, up and down the coast of Vietnam, Saigon, Phnom Penh, all through Cambodia. And I didn't get sick. And I never met anybody else that got sick from eating off the food carts. I mean, what these things look like, you know, they look like these hot dog carts. So there's a couple mountain bike tires, there's something with a handle, there's a big heating element. And basically, it was mainly soup. So they just keep throwing things into the pot, it's boiling. I never got sick. And if you're going to eat the food, you might as well sample the local vintages. So uh, you folks have heard of like the, the mezcal in Mexico that has the worm in the bottle? Yeah. Vietnam, they're not screwing around. So these bottles are about this big. And in the bottle is an entire cobra that's pickling in rice wine. And this particular vintage, uh, there's a cobra and he's got a scorpion in his mouth. 
So the snake wine is supposed to have all these mystical properties. It's supposed to be great for the male virility. Um, I tried it. Didn't do much for me. But I lived. It was fine. Has kind of a rubbery aftertaste. I probably wouldn't drink it again, but it, it was fine. Another thing I tried was a lot of these countries, uh, they don't have the same liability laws that we have here. So they have a lot of adventure sports that would not fly in the US. So this is uh, one of the things they had in New Zealand was something called riverboarding. So you've all heard of whitewater rafting? So this is whitewater rafting without the raft. <laughs> uh, you, have, you have these boogie boards, which is like a giant kickboard. And then they send you out in the rapids. There's a guy waving, yeah, water's nice, come on in. And they're about to head into the rapids. Um, here's somebody else. I think it's a camera on top. That, that, that yellow thing is his head. <laughs> Another thing I tried, well, actually, let me just show it to you. So this is bungee jumping. It's in New Zealand. And they bind your feet up with this cord. And you walk to the end of this little plank. And then you turn around and you ask the guy, you, are you sure this is safe or a, a good idea? And he really couldn't care less. He's just stretching in the background. So nothing else to do but jump. So you bounce up and down, and then they have an electronic winch that brings you back up. So I did this, uh, I did this three times. Uh, I did it, first place I did was in South Africa, and that was much, so this one was about 450 feet. The one in South Africa was uh, 660 feet. So uh, have any of you been to the Peru? You know, they got the top of the hub bar at the top. So this is equivalent of going up to the top and jumping out the window. 
Um, they measure it from the top of the, from the platform all the way down to the bottom, but the cord doesn't go all the way down to the bottom. That would yeah, that would that would hurt a lot. And I, so I did. I went bungee jumping three times. Uh, never saw anyone have any problems. You know, sometimes people would freak out on the platform, but they all eventually jumped. So I didn't really think it was dangerous until I got back and I was poking around on YouTube and... New Year's Eve and 22-year-old Australian Erin Langworthy's bungee jump over the Zambezi River has a certain style as she sets off. Oh. Then disaster as her jumping cord snaps and she plunges into the crocodile infested waters. It went black um, straight away and I felt like I'd been slapped all over. She came to in the swirling rapids but with her feet tied together still not out of danger. I actually had to swim down and yank the bungee cord out of whatever it was caught into. Erin eventually managed to reach the bank of the river, where rescuers pulled her out battered and bruised, but even then her ordeal wasn't over. When I was first pulled out of the water, they put me on my back, and so all the water that I'd inhaled um, meant that I couldn't breathe, so um, I made them roll me onto my side, and that's when I started coughing out water and blood. The safari company that organized the jump calls it 111 meters of pure adrenaline on its website. But another look at Erin's jump shows just how lucky she was. Yes, I think it's definitely a miracle that I survived. Nazanin Sadri, Al Jazeera. So I mentioned earlier that there was one thing I feared more than youth hostels and sharks and bush flies and bungee jumping. And now, here it is. Everybody know what that is? It's a, it's a squat toilet. So how, how, anyone here used one? For those of you who haven't, why don't I describe the experience for you? Inside the little room, I reach for a light switch and can't find one. I reach for the door and can't find one. Against the back wall, there's a hole in the floor surrounded by raised porcelain footrests. Across from it, a saucepan floats in a plastic barrel filled with water. Something with legs and a tail skitters up the wall and onto the ceiling. A faucet protruding, protruding from the tiled wall drip drips into a plastic barrel. A boiling sensation intensifies deep inside me. I drop my pants and hover over the bowl. I grab the rim of the barrel with one hand for stability. With the other hand, I point myself back like a little hose. Money starts to slip out of my pockets. As I go to catch the cash, my um, apparatus springs free and sprays my sandals, feet, and pants. All I can do is let it all go. I think you get the idea, um, but if you want to know how the scene ends, you'll have to buy my book. Uh, that, that's, in, that's in Bangkok. I didn't, take that, I didn't take that photo, but I used one in Phnom Penh, and, and this is immaculate compared to the one I used. Yes, okay, right. Okay, so... Um, So the trip, all the pain, misery, and suffering was actually good preparation for my next venture, which was <laughs> trying to get a book published. Are there any writers out there? Okay, any? Okay, yeah, this is a miserable, horrible experience, and I'm gonna take you through it step by step. So as I mentioned, I was on this trip, I spent a lot of time alone, I'm a writer and a catcher, so I blogged a lot. And by the time I got home, I had 140 pages of material. And this was around the time that uh, this book came out. It's a travel memoir. It's on your list. Um, in 2007, by that time, she'd sold 5 million copies. I was like, I can sell 1%, 50,000, and I'll be happy with that. I'm not greedy. Another travel memoir I, met, I read 
Uh, this is one uh, written by a guy. He goes to the South, South, South Pacific and has a miserable, rotten time. And it's very funny. So I was like, okay, here are a couple books. I can do this. So I signed up for writing classes, joined writing groups, went to overpriced travel, uh, writing conferences. And after a year and a half, I had a travel memoir and I showed it to an agent and the agent said, you know what? There's no market for travel memoirs anymore. Memoirs are hot. Make it a memoir. So this was around the time, has anyone read the book Running with Scissors? Yeah. Okay, so it's a memoir. It takes place in Western Massachusetts, Augustin Burroughs. Um, this was the movie that came out around this time, 2007, 2008. Movie was great. Um, another memoir that was popular around this time was A Million Little Pieces. Anybody familiar with this? So the way, what, James Fry? So he, he wrote a novel and he couldn't sell it. So he said, hmm, ah, I screwed up. It's not fiction. It's all true. It's a memoir. He got a big book deal, made lots of money. Um, o Oprah picked his book for her book list and he's on her show and they're chit-chatting and he mentions that, yeah, I lied. Got busted. He still sold a lot of books and I didn't care. I'll write a memoir. So I sign up for more writing classes, join writing, more writing groups, go to more overpriced writing conferences. After a year and a half, I have a novel and I show it to an agent and the agent says, eh, bummer. There's no longer a market for memoirs unless you're a Kennedy. And I was like, oh, I am a Kennedy. <laughs> so I decided, okay, I'm gonna write a novel. More writing classes, more writing groups, more overpriced writing conferences. After a year and a half, I've turned this thing into a novel. I show it to an agent and she says, you know, you ever thought about making this into a travel memoir? So at this point, I was kind of like, eh, ugh, eh. But then I thought to myself, wait a minute. I just took a trip around the world, and I survived this, I survived that, and I survived this. So I doubled down. I took another year and a half to work on a novel. Um, I, at this point, I also had started reading bits and pieces of my novel around Boston. I'd even memorized a few of the pieces. And I was at a party, and I met a guy who was a theater director. And I'm talking about all the stuff I'm doing, and he says, you know what? You've got enough material for a, a one-man show. And there's actually a circuit of amateur theaters, theater festivals around the U.S. and Canada and Edinburgh, Scotland. They're called fringe festivals. So with this guy's help, I created a one-man show called The Chronic Singles Handbook. And actually, let me tell you about it. The Chronic Singles Handbook is about a chronically single guy who takes a trip around the world hoping to change his luck with love. Sounds kind of wholesome and sweet. You've heard of Eat, Pray, Love? Actually, this is not even remotely like Eat, Pray, Love. There's adult situations, adult language, and more adult situations. So there's twice your daily adult requirement for adult situations in one hour. However, it's based on a novel. So these are high-end, literary adult situations. This is not the cheap sleazy stuff. This is the good stuff. Let me just give you a, a short scene from the beginning of the show. Bangkok. The name alone sounds skeevy. And from the moment I get off the plane, I'm on high alert. I'd read about the deep fried tarantulas, tuk tuk scammers, and locals that play volleyball with their feet. The decor in the airport doesn't help either. Smirking Buddhas, sneering Buddhas, a gang of Buddhas pummeling a three-headed snake. The airport bus drops me downtown on Sukhumvit Road. That's a boulevard that sells me two blocks my hotel. On the corner stands a local woman. She's wearing a t-shirt that says, University of Nebraska. That's Nebraska with just one P. The whole area is peppered with these little carts selling noodles and soup. I start to walk in the sooty, humid air, stings like a lung full of red ants. Immediately, I'm lost, so I approach a guy. He's got a mossy, blonde beard growing down his sternum. He's wearing a fishing vest and shorts, and the chin strap on his wide-brimmed hat is pulled snug against his jowls. It looks like he's bracing for a typhoon. Excuse me, I ask, do you know how to get to a street called Soy 38? You from the US? Uh, yeah, I'm from Boston. Yeah, I'm from Texas. 
I was an MP back in Saigon. One of the last guys out. Last guys out. Wow. Um, do you know, is it okay to eat any of these food carts around here? Oh, you don't want to eat around here. Soy cowboys, just a few subway stops. Subway stops. This whole Sukhumvit area is built on a swamp. I'm going to retire here. Retire here. Then he exhales into his hand and sniffs his breath. In less than two minutes, this guy has confirmed my worst fears about Southeast Asia. This place can do things to you. Permanent, mind-warping things. I put on my hat, tighten my chin strap, and walk away. Walk away. <laughs> so I started doing this show around the US, Canada, and I got some good reviews. If you insist, I'll read you a few. <laughs> Four stars. Ross's honesty makes the self-deprecating voyage of sometimes lurid self-discovery a lot of fun to watch. Winnipeg Fringe Festival. A delightful show that kept the crowd laughing at all the right times. A fringe show that is worth seeing for the chronically single or very married alike. Orlando Fringe Festival. Sharply funny. Some of life's tougher punchlines. A quality solo show. Edinburgh Fringe Festival. So at this point, I'm feeling pretty good. My show's doing okay. And finally, I finished the book, 2015. It's 80,000 words, which is 325 Microsoft Word pages. So the way the process works, if you want to get a big book deal with big money, you need a big publisher, and the first thing you need is a literary agent. And the way you get a literary agent is you send them a one-page letter called a query letter, and that just, it's a pitch for your book. And I'm just going to give you a, uh, read you mine real quickly. So there's three parts to a query letter. Um, the first paragraph is where you give a, a one, one sentence summary of the book, and then you describe other books that are similar to it, so the, the uh, agents know what the market is for the book. And the book, uh, the title of the book, my title was The Loneliest Planet, so it's a takeoff on Lonely Planet. And the actual narrator in the book his name is Randall Burns. My first name is Randy, so I want to use the name Randy because in certain countries, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, Randy has another connotation which was perfect for the book. <laughs> so, dear agent, my comedic novel, The Loneliest Planet, offers an unflinching look at how men feel about sex, love, marriage, and massage parlors. The audience includes men seeking insight into their own psyches, women seeking insight into men, and anyone interested in a gritty, bittersweet romantic comedy. It should appeal to readers of Jonathan Tropper, Joshua Ferris, and Sam Lipsight. So these are three guys that write about dysfunctional relationships. They're whiny Jewish guys like me. <laughs> so that's the first, first paragraph where you kind of set the stage. And the next couple paragraphs describe the actual book. The story follows the picaresque adventures of Randall Burns, 48, chronically single, and recently downsized out of a long-time job. Sounds a little familiar. He blows his severance on a trip around the world, hoping to change his luck with love. On the trip, Burns strikes out with women on three continents and suffers loneliness that would have broken Papillon. On the fourth continent, Burns accepts, accepts that he's going to die alone, and the sooner the better. He bungee jumps, eats food from street carts, and visits a body spa named The Curious Finger. <laughs> he lets go of his germophobia and his quest for a woman and begins to enjoy himself. His ex-girlfriend emails. She's now on antidepressants and sorry for her past behavior. Is his luck with love about to change? So that took me three years to come up with those four paragraphs. <laughs> so I'm done. Manuscript's done. Query letter's done. Let's send this out to some agents. So I sent it out to 30 agents, and none of them wanted it. I sent it out to 40 agents, and none of them wanted it. I sent it out to 30 more agents, and none of them wanted it. 
So I was going to, my goal was to send it out to 120 agents. And the way I got that number was I was talking to a literary agent at some conference. And the guy said to me, one of my clients sent his query letter out to 120 agents. And I was number 120. And I was like, what, so what was the name of the book? And he said, it's the Silver Linings Playbook. So I was going to do 120. I got to 110. I was like, eh, why don't we hedge some bets? So the process is, if you can't get a big publisher with the big money with an agent, you become your own agent and you start sending your book out yourself to smaller publishers. So that's what I started doing. I sent it out to five small publishers and these guys were interested. I got a call in February and they're like, hey, you know, we liked your book. Um, we're going to send you a contract. So I mentioned before that I spend too much time on the internet. Um, so I get the contract from these guys and I get on the internet and I find this is a website called Predators and Editors. <laughs> so here's the thing about fraud artists and scamming authors to talk about small presses. And here's another one called Writer Beware. And the, you know, authors, you know, they're not paying their royalties and you know, so it's nonstop uh, rip-offs, scanner, scammers, fleece artists, rip-offs, scammers, fleece artists, parasites, parasites, parasites. So I decided to consult an expert and hired a lawyer. <laughs> so the lawyer goes through the contract and he's making all these comments and suggestions and I'm getting kind of freaked out. I'm going to call the publisher. This is the only one that has made, made an offer. And I put together this whole spreadsheet, you know, if they say this, I'm going to say that. And I, you know, I'm, I'm rehearsing this, you know, all, all up and down and backwards and forwards. And I got all written down. I'm getting ready to make the phone call. And I'm like, let me call my father. So my father's 80 years old. He's been in business his whole life. So I call him up and, Dad, any advice for the big negotiation? And he says, well, um, how many other offers do you have? Um, none. Shut up and sign the contract. <laughs> so I signed the contract. The next issue is the publisher, so I signed the contract. Um, the publisher sends you ideas for a cover. And they're supposed to send you two, and they only sent me one. And um, my concern here is, okay, my book's literary fiction. There's no beer bottles in literary fiction. This should be like a champagne flute or a wine glass or something. This, this is not beer bottles. So I'm like kind of distressed about this and I show this to friends and they don't like it either. But the other thing they sent me was this, this is my author photo that they kind of doctored up. So my, some of my friends were like, hey, why don't you make that the cover? So I was like, oh, I don't really know what to do. So I call my father again and he's not home. My mother picks up the phone. So I show her this, and I show her that, and I'm like, you know, Ma, any suggestions? So, Mr. Big Shot Author, how long have you been in book publishing? Um, uh, um, three weeks. How long have they been in book publishing? Uh, 35 years. Shut up, the cover's fine. <laughs> The next problem, okay, uh, the publisher sends me the contract that I signed. They also send you this note. Let me read it to you. Dear author, before you sign your contract, we wanted you to know what the book world is like. Generally speaking, books by non-celebrities sell between 700 and 1,500 copies. To even ensure that many sales, it is imperative that the pre Publication reviews be good ones. So what they do, my book was supposed to come out in March, November, they send the book out to all these reviewers. And look at the top, it says no reviews, no book. So they send it out in November, December 21st, no reviews. December 28th, no reviews. January 10th, we get a phone call from the publisher. He's not very happy. Basically, he says, no review, no book. You can keep the $1,000, but you're not getting a book. We'll do an e-book, but no book. So I'm begging, I'm pleading, I'll buy, I'll buy every single book. I'm on the ground, I'm you know, 
tears. I go to my therapist's office. I'm on the ground again. How, you know, why me? How could this happen? Two weeks later, I get a call from the publisher. My book got reviewed by Kirkus. Then it got reviewed again. So, after all the diseases and parasites and guinea worms and great white sharks and Australian bush flies and street carts and bungee jumping and query letters and rejections and contracts and reviews, I finally got my book. <laughs> <laughs> but they changed the beer bottle to a better looking one. Uh, yeah, well, they had to change the label because they used a real label before. Oh, oh, right. <laughs> so that's, that's my show. Um, I have time for questions. Also, if anyone is interested in the book, I have books for sale. Um, one question I get often is uh, so. How much of this book is, it's a novel, but how much of it, how much of it, how much of it is true? And the answer is 12%. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a question for you guys. How many people are, were here because of the travel? Were interested in the travel part? Anyone interested in the publishing part? Maybe, okay, good, good to know. Um, I'll, if you guys have any questions, I would be happy to translate this book into Chinese. Uh, you might want to read it first. <laughs> adult situations, adult language, and more adult situations. Okay, because I was wondering if we um, think the host family community would be happy to read that. Because a lot of them travel a lot. Oh, okay. And they host Chinese students at their home. So I think that would be a good the, uh, I would read the book first. This, this is a comedy. This is a racy comedy. Now, what did Dr. Moody think of the book? <laughs> Dr. Moody hasn't read it yet. That's the, that's the psychiatrist who's in the book. He, he's a friend of mine who's read the book. How many copies have been sold? About 400, which is not great. Did I miss it or did you get the title? That was, that's their, oh, you didn't miss it. That was their title. They didn't like, so the titles I gave them were The Loneliest Planet, and the Chronic Singles Handbook and the publisher said those are both too negative. Um, they gave me some ideas that I thought were terrible. Um, this one I thought was good enough. But yeah, I, I don't, it, they bought the book so they have the final say on everything. You know, they asked me, what do you think? And, I'm like, and I just, I said, I don't like it. And they were like, okay. <laughs> thank you for sharing. Bum yeah, thank you for sharing. Bummer. Bummer. What's the first name of the reviewer again? Of the reviewer? Yeah, who was the first one? Who uh, book, book list and Kirkus. Oh, book list is the first one? Uh, the first one was Kirkus, and the second one was book list. Those are the two. I, mean, it's, it's, if I, I can give you a card of my website. It's, got the, it's been reviewed a bunch of times. Okay. I have listed all the reviews up there, and there's a couple pages of the book. So, you, again, you should read it before you start. <laughs> I'm sorry, somebody... Are you saying, did I hear you correctly, that only 12% is true? Yeah, I'm joking, but... Uh, oh, okay. yeah, it's, a, it's a novel, so, it's so the, things that are, the things that are true are the narrator, like me, worked for a computer magazine, got laid off, took a trip around the world and had a rotten time, and there's one other thing that I'm not going to mention. <laughs> okay. Would you take, have you traveled since? I have. I, I, I wouldn't do this again. I mean, this is four months of travel solo travel. Um, some people can do it. I have a cousin that goes for six months by himself. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it again. But you, you, know, you don't know until you do it. I, yeah, I do, I do plenty of traveling now. So I was doing, I was doing my show at these fringe festivals. So I, you, know, you go on for six weeks, you're touring you know, all around Canada and you're sleeping on people's couches and it's a little, a little rough. But yeah. As, as a fellow budget traveler, do you have any recommendations for airlines or stayways? Um, they're all horrible. <laughs> and it, it, it used to be different, but now that you just crammed, I mean, it's much cheaper now, but yeah, I don't. And what I did for this trip was th there used to be something called uh, 
I think it's called One World. So you buy one ticket and you can, they'll book you on a whole bunch of different airlines and as long as you keep going in one direction, it's cheap. Um, you can go north, south, you just can't go back and forth. I don't know if that's still available, but that was the cheapest, easiest way to get all the way around the world. Could sure. you go back to any place? Any uh, places like? Uh, yeah. Some, um, I'd go back to Southeast Asia. Um, that's probably, probably about it. Uh, Greece. Yeah, I, hear, I hear Greece is nice. He, he, he's Greek. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I mean, I, I go, I've been skiing in France. And, uh, but I, I would go with some activity instead of just going to some of these places and just kind of hanging out. And that, that's hard. What would you do differently if you do it again? I, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't go by, my, I wouldn't go by myself. Yeah. You would go with family and friends. Planning a trip to Thailand coming up. Any suggestions? I had a great time. It was fun. Um, the pl there's plenty of youth hostels like right in uh, Bangkok. Are you going to Bangkok? I mean, you're going to land there. Yes. So, well, we're still in the midst of planning it, but there's a yoga retreat a friend and I are going to go to, and then we're kind of planning the rest of the trip around that. So, we're kind of. I mean, Chiang Mai is the you ride you ride elephants up there. I mean, the beaches are gorgeous. Cool. Yeah, the beaches are where most people go. I, I didn't go to the beaches. No. I went to the beaches uh, uh, in Cambodia, which were not as nice as the ones, the ones in Thailand are supposed to be gorgeous. Okay. Um, Ireland, any suggestions? Never been. Okay. So I think, um, I think, we're, I think we're all set. Um, I have books for sale over there. And uh, thank you for coming, appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs>